Hello and welcome to We On Live, broadcast from London. I'm Ollie Barrett. Thanks for joining us. We've got the latest on stories developing all around the world coming up, and we'll start with the headlines. Russia holds its annual parade to mark the Soviet victory in World War II. President Putin blasts NATO, saying the military alliance is creating an unacceptable threat for Russia. Also commemorating victory over Nazi Germany in World War II, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says his country will win the war with Russia and Ukraine will not give up territory. Sri Lankan Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa has submitted his resignation to the president as clashes break out between his supporters and protesters. A curfew is imposed and the military is called in in Colombo. Millions of Filipinos head to polling stations to choose Duterte's successor, with the son of former dictator Ferdinand Marcos Jr. the favourite to win the presidential vote. Shanghai residents scuffle with officials and workers, storm factory gates demanding an end to COVID-19 lockdown. We'll start in Russia, where a highly anticipated Victory Day speech from Russian President Vladimir Putin has seen him defend his decision to invade Ukraine. Speaking at the Victory Day parade in Moscow, which commemorates the defeat of Nazi Germany in 1945, Putin said Russia was facing an absolutely unacceptable threat in Ukraine and claimed that Russian soldiers are fighting for their motherland. В эти дни вы сражаетесь за наших людей на Донбассе, за безопасность нашей Родины, России. There was no major announcement during the 11-minute long Red Square speech, as some had been speculating that there would be. It also offered no assessment of progress in the war and gave no hints how long the invasion might continue. Putin did reiterate some of his earlier justifications for what he calls a special military operation in Ukraine. He claimed that NATO and Ukraine had been creating unacceptable threats on the Russian borders, and he alleged the West was preparing to invade Russia, including Crimea. Страны НАТО не захотели нас услышать. А это значит, что на самом деле у них были совершенно другие планы. Планомерно создавалась абсолютно неприемлемая для нас угроза. Причем непосредственно у наших границ. The president called for a minute of silence, not only for Russians killed in World War II, but also soldiers fighting for Russia in the Donbass, a region of Ukraine containing Russian-backed separatists. Columns of soldiers marched as they do every year, and armoured personnel carriers with intercontinental missiles were on display. The Victory Day Parade has traditionally been a day of national pride in Russia, 
and former Soviet Union countries, which suffered the highest tolls of any nation in World War II. Up to 27 million Soviets were killed in the war, either due to famine or fighting. Under President Putin, this day has taken on more of a military overtone. Meanwhile, across the border, a defiant Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, maintained that Ukraine would win this conflict. День перемоги над нацизмом. Ми боремось за нову перемогу. Шлях до неї важкий, але ми не сумніваємось, що переможемо. В чому наша перевага над ворогом? Ми розумніші на одну книгу. Це підручник з історії України. Ми б не знали горя, якби всі наші вороги вміли читати і робити правильні висновки. After failing to capture the Ukrainian capital of Kiev, Russia is currently pushing its military in eastern Ukraine and has claimed control of the key port city of Mariupol on the Sea of Azov. The group of seven wealthy nations known as the G7 has agreed to ratchet up further economic pressure on Russia. The US, France, Canada, Germany, Italy, Japan, the UK and US have committed to phasing out Russian oil. The statement did not specify exactly what commitments each country would make to move away from Russian energy, but said that actions would be orderly and in ways that provided time for the world to secure alternative supplies. Among the G7 countries, the United States has not been a major consumer of Russian oil in recent times and had already banned their import. Europe is far more reliant and the European Union has said that it is aiming to cut its reliance on Russian gas by two-thirds this year. Germany's opposed calls for a full boycott. This was the group's third meeting this year, with the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky participating from Kiev. Japan, which is heavily dependent on energy imports, says it will take time to phase out Russian oil imports, taking into account the actual situation. え、石油に the United States also unveiled a host of actions against Russia. This includes sanctioning Gazprom Bank executives and three Russian television stations, banning Americans from providing accounting and consulting services to Russians, and imposing 2,600 visa restrictions on Russian and Belarusian officials. The sanctions against Gazprom bank executives were the first involving the giant Russian gas exporter. The US has clarified, though, that the measures are only against some of its top business executives. The assets of Gazprom bank are not being frozen in this move or any transactions being prohibited. The United Kingdom has also expanded its sanctions with punitive import tariffs on Russian precious metals like platinum and palladium. Also announced by the UK was an export ban on certain British products like chemicals, plastics, rubber and machinery, all sectors where Russia is dependent on UK demand. The latest measures announced by Britain will bring the total value of products subject to sanctions to over $4 billion. UK opposition Labour Party leader Keir Starmer is facing claims of hypocrisy as the week gets underway. This as he's being investigated now for possibly breaking Covid lockdown rules. A leaked memo published in British media suggests that Keir Starmer had an 80-minute dinner with Labour MP Mary Foy and other staff in Durham last year. 
Video of him drinking beer had already been circulating, but Starmer and the Labour Party have been insisting that no lockdown rules were broken because it was a work event and not a social one. On Friday, Durham Police announced that they were reopening their investigation into the event. Conservative sources now point to the fact that Keir Starmer had been leading the calls for Prime Minister Boris Johnson to resign when he was accused over what they say are similar events. Both the Justice Secretary and the Deputy Prime Minister have said that the Labour leader had a bunch of questions to answer about the event in Durham. On April the 30th last year, England was under so-called Step 2 rules. Gathering indoors with people from outside your household was against the law. There was an exemption for work purposes, but the rules did not mention socialising at work. Bars and restaurants were open outdoors for groups of six people or two households, but indoor service was not allowed. So the question before Durham Police will be whether the Labour officials eating and drinking together, whether that was necessary for work. And for more, we can go to our London correspondent now, Laura Makin Isherwood, who's joining me uh, live. And Laura, how much of a distraction is this for Keir Starmer at a time when he'd probably rather be talking about local election results from last week? Well, quite a significant one, really. He's actually pulled out of a planned event that he was meant to attend today. Uh, His officials saying plans change. That's the reason that's being given for that move. But of course, he would have been facing journalists there at that think tank uh, where he was giving that speech. And understandably, many of those journalists may want to have asked some questions about this alleged event. And of course, as you've said, the elections locally took place here uh, last week. It was pretty successful for Labour by uh, all accounts. They won a number of authorities. Councils took control from the Conservatives. The Conservatives, of course, lost uh, a number of their councils too. So it was a mixed bag for the Conservatives. But for Labour, this should have been a week to really push forward and perhaps uh, press on the public that they are moving forward towards the next general election and put forward their plans Uh, make out that they are indeed a party that can lead. But now Sir Keir Starmer, the the leader of the Labour Party, is under questions, uh, facing questions himself over whether he should indeed be at the head of that party at that time. He has said that he will not step down. He will continue and be the leader of the Labour Party at the next general election. But there are now some uh, reports in The Times that he may be considering that he would step down if he is found to have breached those rules. If the police do find that he has uh, done something wrong in that respect, of course, they are only reports in one newspaper, still awaiting that official announcement from Labour, if indeed it does come forward. But plenty of people now have their eyes on the Labour leader as to whether he himself has breached those lockdown rules. OK, and what about the Conservative Party response to all of this? They don't seem yet to be calling for Starmer to resign if he is fined by police. Why ever might that be? Well, of course, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has been under his own uh, sort of watch and scrutiny of late, hasn't he, after, after those uh, parties that took place in Downing Street over a similar period of time. Of course, there is the ongoing investigation by police. People have been issued with fines within uh, number 10. And if the Conservatives and the Prime Minister were to call for Sir Keir Starmer to step down, then there may be many people wondering whether the Prime Minister should follow uh, that call as well and uh, leave that office. So it may be in the favour of the government, the current government, to maybe not be so aggressive with its calls for that. However, they are saying that it's hypocritical of Sir Keir Starmer to be pressing on the Conservatives, uh, firing a lot of Uh, questions at Boris Johnson at PMQs in Parliament when clearly there may be some questions about Sir Keir Starmer's own behaviour. So the Conservatives accusing him of hypocrisy, saying that there are plenty of questions to answer, but as you said, not so far calling significantly for him to resign. Thank you, Laura. Now, after elections in Northern Ireland that Laura was mentioning, uncertainty looms over its political future. 
The Democratic Unionist Party, or the DUP, is seeking an urgent meeting with Prime Minister Boris Johnson to warn him that the party will stall power sharing at the Stormont Assembly until Christmas if the post-Brexit Northern Ireland protocol is not modified. A senior party leader says that the party will push the responsibility for Stormont back onto the Prime Minister. If power sharing is stalled until Christmas, then Northern Ireland may have to go to the polls again. The ultimatum from the Unionist Party comes after Johnson's government threatened to tear up the Northern Ireland Protocol unless the European Union agrees to major changes to it. Now, meanwhile, Sinn Féin have become the biggest party in Northern Ireland's elections for the first time ever. The Nationalist Party wants to see Northern Ireland unified with the Republic of Ireland. The DUP are unionists and want Northern Ireland to remain part of the UK. Sinn Féin are now in a position to take on the first minister position in a government, but that can only happen with the DUP's agreement. In a major setback for Chancellor Olaf Scholz, his party is projected to lose provincial elections in the northern German state of Schleswig-Holstein just five months after he was elected. According to projections, Germany's centre-right Christian Democrat Union, or the CDU, is slated to win the elections with exit polls predicting it could secure 41 to 42 per cent of the votes. The Greens are expected to come in second with between 17 to 19 per cent. And Chancellor Scholz's centre-left Social Democrats, or the SPD, projected to see their vote share drop to around 16 per cent. That's down from 27 per cent in the last election. And then on Sunday, regional elections are due in North Rhine-Westphalia, which is the most populous state of Germany and where the ruling CDU is currently in power. Pre-poll surveys show a tight race between the CDU and the SPD. A loss there would be a significant blow for the CDU. For Chancellor Scholz, a win would help solidify his position as leader of the three-party coalition. He's recently been criticised for his response to the Ukraine war. According to a Der Spiegel poll in April, 65% of Germans said they didn't find Scholz to be a strong leader. Israel's parliament has returned from its break to start the summer session as the ruling government continues to fight for its survival after losing its majority during the break. The political turmoil intensified after former whip and Yamina politician Idit Silman defected from her party last month to join the opposition Likud. This led to the governing coalition of Prime Minister Naftali Bennett losing its majority in the Knesset. The crisis was aggravated after Islamist Arab party Ra'am decided to freeze its membership in the coalition due to recent flare-ups at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. If the Arab party were to pull its four seats from the coalition, the bennett Lapid government would find itself in a clear minority. Meanwhile, opposition parties are now considering a no-confidence motion against the government. On Sunday, opposition party heads held a meeting at the Likud party's headquarters in Tel Aviv, agreeing to continue the determined and unified fight to topple the government. The opposition is also reportedly weighing whether to bring forward a non-governmental bill to disperse the government on Wednesday. If passed in the preliminary debate, it would then be discussed in future sessions for a final approval. We on correspondent Jody Cohen reports from Elad. I'm in there, lad, at the scene of a terror attack in which three men lost their lives at the weekend, leaving 16 children orphaned. Following further attacks and attempted attacks in Jerusalem and Tekoa, Israel is preparing for a civilian volunteer force to join the police and army in helping to defend its communities. It's also considering whether to target Hamas in Gaza for inciting violence or to pursue those involved in violence in Jenin, where many of the perpetrators have come from. 
This comes amid the reopening of the Knesset, Israel's parliament today, and possible no-confidence votes in the coalition government in the coming week. With a deadlocked parliament, all eyes will be on the Islamist Ram party to see if they will stay in the government, as their leader Mansour Abbas apparently would like, or if they will leave as party members consider their political futures. This is Jody Cohen for We On, World as One. Meanwhile, tensions between Israel and the Palestinians have worsened after Israeli forces arrested two Palestinians. Following the arrests, incidents of violence were reported where two Palestinians were shot dead. Another was reported wounded. Two Palestinians who killed three Israelis in an attack in an ultra-Orthodox Jewish town were apprehended on Sunday, according to Israeli security forces. Israeli forces had mounted an extensive search since the incident on Thursday, also Israel's Independence Day, in which two axe-wielding assailants ran through Ilad, some nine miles north of Tel Aviv. The men have been identified by Israel as residents of a village near the Palestinian city of Jenin in the occupied West Bank. They were captured in a forest near Ilad. Thursday's incident was the latest in a recent upsurge of Israeli-Palestinian violence that has raised fears of a slide back to wider conflict. Palestinians and members of Israel's Arab minority have killed 18 people in attacks in Israel and the West Bank that have mostly targeted civilians. Israel has responded with arrest raids in Palestinian towns and villages, which have often sparked clashes. The number of Palestinians killed by Israeli forces since the beginning of the year is at least 40. Hamas, the Islamist group that controls Gaza, praised the Alad assault but did not claim responsibility. It said the attack was a response to Israeli actions at the Alaska Mosque compound in Jerusalem. Over the past month, Palestinians and Israeli police have repeatedly clashed at the sensitive complex. Palestinians accuse Israel of not doing enough to enforce a long-standing ban on non-Muslim prayer there, which Israel denies. The compound is Judaism's holiest site and the vestige of two ancient Jewish temples. Ukraine's famous mine-sniffing dog, Patron, has been awarded a medal by President Volodymyr Zelensky, recognising his dedicated service since the Russian invasion. The pint-sized Jack Russell Terrier has been credited with detecting more than 200 explosives and preventing their detonation. We will leave you with the story of that excellent dog. Thank you very much for watching. Do stay tuned. Uh, stay tuned for World. more on World is One. Uh, we on and I will be with you tomorrow at the same time from Riga in Latvia. Was the order for courage third degree? And medal for the dedicated service. Uh, is this a dress, uh, Arab?